I'm just thrilled to welcome Paul Woodruff to uh, Grand Valley State University and to this remarkable um, tradition of the home marathon. Dr. Woodruff is the Daryl K. Royal Professor in Ethics and American Society at the University of Texas at Austin. Those of you who are familiar with the Agon of um, college football might know the name, Daryl K. Royal. Professor Woodruff was born in New Jersey and raised in Western Pennsylvania, earned a degree in classics from Princeton University, um, a bachelor's degree in uh, humane letters from Oxford. Uh, for those of you who realize uh, all the dimensions of reading a book about war and courage and laws. He served as a junior officer in the United States Army at Chow Duck at the uh, Delta of Vietnam from June 1969 to June 1970 and was discharged in 1971 at the rank of captain. Um, he did the natural thing. He went on to get his PhD in philosophy from Princeton in 1973 and began teaching at UT Austin with his specialty in ancient Greek philosophy. He's been chair of the Department of, of Philosophy. He directed the Plan 2 honors program. Uh, is that a step up from Plan 1? You Perhaps you'll tell us. Um, and he became uh, the inaugural dean of the School of Undergraduate Studies in 2006. He served in that role for six years. His scholarship is uh, extraordinarily well known, and uh, if you have uh, the chance to read it, to pick up, say, the Ajax dilemma, which uh, concerns justice and the, sometimes you may have noticed uneven distribution of rewards, um, you'll know what a treat it is to think along with him. But so do his students at Texas. He has won the Ransom Teaching Award. He was inducted into UT Austin's Academy of Distinguished Teachers uh, and this past year, former students and colleagues announced their intention to endow a chair in his name for excellence in undergraduate study, a chair that will go to a different faculty member every year who's dedicated to improving a part of the core curriculum. We've just gone through uh, the beginning of a renewal of our general education program, and so we know how valuable that is. This is a teacher scholar par excellence, and I am thrilled to welcome you here, Paul Woodruff. Thank you, Dean Anzac. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. It's a very dark night for the Greek army outside the city of Troy. They are in despair. The, Tro the Trojans have been, have beaten them back. The Greeks are afraid that any minute now the Trojans will come and burn their ships and they'll be stranded. Meanwhile, the soldier, the greatest soldier of them all at the time, Achilles, is sulking in his tent and refusing to fight because he was bitterly insulted by the stupid king, Agamemnon. <laughs> Nestor, the old man, says, this night will either destroy the army or save it. And this is the crucial night 
that will destroy the army or save it, and we'll see how it comes out. Who is the best of the Greeks? Well, right now it seems it's Achilles, and he's not willing to fight. But Achilles, as you may know, has an Achilles heel. And he's not going to be there forever, even if he does stay and fight. After Achilles, who is the best of the Greeks? I'm going to give you an opportunity to vote on this a little bit later on tonight, and then I'll, I'll tell you the true answer, which I, I'm keeping a secret, and it will surprise you, but I think you'll agree with it when we get there. Agamemnon is in despair. Most of the Greek army is in despair. But the wise old soldier Nestor makes the suggestion that they not throw in the sponge just yet, that they try to engage Achilles once more in the fight, because if he's with them, perhaps they will win. So Agamemnon now recognizes his mistake. He was wrong to insult Achilles, and he's prepared to make up for it. He's going to offer an amazing treasure house of gifts to appease Achilles and to satisfy his hunger for honor. And one of his own daughters as a wife. And whatever else he wants, Agamemnon will do anything to bring Achilles back because without Achilles, he doesn't think he has a hope. Nestor recommends that they send an embassy. Three picked men will go to the tent where Achilles is sulking and try to persuade him to come back into the fight. Phoenix, dear to Zeus, Ajax, and brilliant Odysseus. Phoenix, the old man who was a kind of a nurse to Achilles and brought him up. Ajax, the biggest, strongest, bravest, most loyal, toughest soldier in the army. A man as big as several ordinary men who carries a shield even larger than he is. And of course, the brilliant, the wily, the cunning, the polytropos, the many twisting and turning man, Odysseus, whom you may know as Ulysses. If they succeed on their embassy, if they are able to persuade Achilles to come back to war, then, well, then this latest onslaught of the Trojans will be beaten back. But then something else will happen. You know Achilles had an Achilles heel. Achilles knows it too. And he knows that in his life there are two possible endings. There is glory and a short life, or there is just a quiet, peaceful old age and no glory. So if he goes back to battle, he will win undying fame, as indeed he has done. We all know his name. And he gets played by Brad Pitt, so <laughs> he did win undying fame. But he died very young. Right? So think about what hangs on this mission. These three men have got to persuade Achilles to make a choice that will lead to his early death. He knows that. What kind of persuasion could possibly be more powerful than the persuasion that will lead a man to put his life in the balance in that way? How can you persuade a man or a woman now to go to combat? Well, we know, <clears throat> by the way, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's coming, so you won't be surprised. Uh, the embassy will succeed only partially. Achilles will stay around 
uh, a little bit longer, and during the period he sticks around, his best friend Patroclus will be killed, and that will sting Achilles with a new anger, a new rage, which he will carry into the Trojan army and kill the great Trojan hero Hector. And the last line of the Iliad will be, such was the funeral of Hector, the tamer of horses. But of course, Homer's audience knew that the story goes on and on because Troy is not yet taken. Years will pass before Troy is taken. And during those years, Achilles will die. In the ninth year of a ten-year war, we've recently had a war that uh, lasted almost ten years. We know what a, a ten-year war is exhausting. In the ninth year of a ten-year war, Achilles is killed. And his armor, which was made by a god, Hephaestus, out of precious metals to the most fabulously artistic design, that armor is left as a prize to the best of the Greeks, which is why I have the title I have. Who is the best of the Greeks now that Achilles is gone? Well, if you've taken a philosophy course, you should immediately ask, best at what? Because, <coughs> of course, there are many different things that you might be best at. You know, you might be best at running, you might be best at punching people, you might be rest, best at reading Greek, you might be best at playing checkers. Who is the best of the Greeks? Pretty hard question to answer. <coughs> but when the prize was announced that the armor will go to the best of the Greeks, two candidates stood forward. And they were two of those who were included in the embassy. So we're going to be talking about them, and then, of course, we'll talk about what they did in the embassy, and then we'll talk about what happens to them later during the contest. The two contestants are Ajax, the human wall, and Odysseus, the wily Odysseus. Now let me read a, a, a little bit from parts of the Iliad that you haven't gotten to yet, so you get a sense of what these two men are like. First of all, Ajax. The uh, Trojans are pushing towards the Greeks, the Greek ships, and Ajax, who was something more than human, finds Odysseus beleaguered, surrounded by Trojans, barely holding them off, and Ajax will save the life of Odysseus. That's important, remember that. Are you the better man if you're the one who saves or the one who is saved? Ajax, who was something more than human, followed. They found Odysseus beset by a crowd of Trojans. Yellow jackals in the mountains chased down an antlered stag. Wounded by hunter's arrow, the stag has escaped the human and runs quickly as long as the blood flows warm and his knees have spring. Eventually the arrow defeats him and the jackals tear into pieces in the green shade. But then a mountain god brings a lion to raven them all, and the jackals scatter while the lion settles down to his meal. <coughs> That's the image for Ajax. With Trojans all over him like the jackals on the stag, with Trojans all over him, Odysseus fell back on experience and instinct to keep himself alive, shooting his spear out whenever one of his assailants got too close. Then Ajax was there, planting himself with his wall of a shield, and the Trojans slunk off by ones and twos. Menelaus led Odysseus away, holding him by his hand. But the Greeks are in retreat, and you can imagine how important it is in retreat to have a soldier like Ajax, uh, if you know anything about uh, what happens to soldiers in combat, the most dangerous thing to do, of course, is a retrograde movement, otherwise known as a retreat. Uh, you have to avoid panic, you have to keep people in order, and you have to defend your rear as you withdraw. So too Ajax, resenting every step he took, 
back from the Trojans. He feared for the ships. The Trojans and their allies kept up the pressure on Ajax, hitting his shield with their polished spears. With their polished spears. Every now and again, Ajax would remember who he was and turn on them, pushing back entire phalanxes of horse-taming Trojans. Then he would give ground, but even in retreat, it was big Ajax who kept the enemy from the ships. Big Ajax who stood between the Trojans and the Greeks, collecting the spears that were thrown hard enough to reach his enormous shield. Many fell short, sticking in sand instead of the flesh they yearned for. That's Ajax. Now, who's Odysseus? Odysseus, not a bad fighter, as fighters go, but he's, he's not Ajax. And he was, uh, in this case I just read about, he was uh, surrounded by Trojans and unable to fight his way back. But Ajax alone could save him. Now, on this night, a certain night, uh, after the embassy, Odysseus wants to find out what's going on in the Trojan camp, and he sneaks out with his friend Diomedes, who's a bigger, stronger soldier than he is, and they capture a Trojan spy named Dolon. And the spy is terrified. He falls on his knees. He pleads for his life. And Odysseus, as wily as they come, get a grip, man. No one's going to kill you. But tell me this and give me a straight answer. What are you doing out here by the ships alone at night when everyone's sleeping? Do you have a mind to strip a corpse or two? Or did Hector send you out on espionage? Or are you acting on your own volition? Dolon's knees were shaking as he answered, Hector lured me into this, filling my mind with foolish hopes. And Dolon, in his panic, goes on to spill his guts. He tells Odysseus and Diomedes everything, why he's there, what they know about the Greeks, how the Trojan army is uh, arranged on the battlefield, who is sleeping where. They give, Dolon gives to the two Greeks the information they need to carry on, carry out a raid, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And after Dolon has told them all, does uh, Odysseus remember his promise? Yet a grip man, no one's going to kill you. Dolon was reaching up to Diomedes in supplication, had almost touched his chin, when Diomedes sprang and with his sword severed the tendons at the nape of the neck. He was still shrieking when his mouth caught the sand. And Odysseus held up his trophies and prayed to Athena, rejoice in these goddess, first of Olympians, to receive our offerings. So that's Odysseus. In the night, captures a spy, promises him immunity, kills him, and then goes on with his friend into the Thracian camp where they kill a number of, of soldiers. These are allies of Troy. They kill a number of soldiers in their sleep steal some horses, and drive the horses back across the lines to the Greek camp, uh, howling with laughter at their success. That's Odysseus. Now, you know enough about these, perhaps, uh, to vote. Ajax always where he's needed, when a friend is in trouble, Ajax is there, the human wall with his wall of a shield, there to protect his friends. Odysseus, as you may know, is the man who is going to invent the Trojan horse. He hasn't done it yet, but he's the only Greek who is good enough at dirty tricks uh, that he can win the war, because this war is not going to be won by anything but dirty tricks. Trojan horse is a pretty dirty trick, as you know. So of these two men, Ajax and Odysseus, uh, who would you rather have as a friend? And I'm, here's the way I'm going to do it. If you think it should be, you'd rather have Ajax as your friend, uh, point to the window. If you'd rather have Odysseus, point to the wall. So uh, 
Ajax or Odysseus, who would make the best friend? It's not, a, yeah, it's, I think there's a slight majority for Ajax, uh, but there certainly were some votes for Odysseus. I'm not going to count them. Uh, now, uh, suppose you're a Trojan, you're an enemy of the Greeks, which of these guys frightens you more? Which of these is going to be your most feared enemy? Ajax or Odysseus? Same place. Ajax to the wall, I mean to the window, Odysseus to the wall. Yeah. Everybody vote, come on. Okay, uh, good. Uh, Ajax is pretty frightening. But there's this good thing about Ajax. You can see him coming. <laughs> you know, in the episode that I just read you, Odysseus is out at night. He is going to sneak in, leading his friend Diomedes on the basis of information he called from a spy uh, and uh, slaughter some sleeping soldiers. Now, one more vote. And then we'll, there'll be a little voting later on, too. Uh, of these two, Ajax and Odysseus, which one do you think will be most effective as a speaker? Which one do you think is most likely to change the mind of the sulking Achilles? Ajax or Odysseus? Everybody vote. I think Odysseus won Yeah, on that one. Uh, as he did, I think, slightly in the previous one. More people wanted Ajax as a friend, more people feared Odysseus as an enemy, and but more people thought Odysseus would be the effective speaker. And indeed, Odysseus is a spectacularly successful liar. He becomes uh, proverbial in Greek culture for being the master of the quick and effective lie. He's the one who tells the giant Polyphemus, the one-eyed giant, that his name is Udes. Sounds like Odysseus, but it means no one. So when the Cyclops is in a rage and his friends shout from their caves, who is it that's hurting you? And Cyclops says, no one. Okay, they don't come to his, to help him. Very, Odysseus is that clever. He's a master of the quick lie. He ought to be able to speak effectively to Achilles, if anybody can. So let's now go back to the embassy. As the, as the three men go out, everybody is expecting, as I, as I think most of you did, that Odysseus is the key to success here. Who will make the most effective speech? Odysseus speaks first. And he plays on, I mean, he gives a thorough catalog of all the gifts that Agamemnon is going to make. Uh, he, and he appeals to uh, Achilles' honor. Uh, he quotes Achilles' uh, father, promises the rewards, uh, and he promises that if Achilles rejoins the fight, he can do something about Hector. And here is how Achilles answers Odysseus' speech. It's a long, brilliant speech, well-constructed. The man has studied rhetoric, perhaps with your dean. Uh, the trouble with people who study rhetoric is that when they start talking, you know they studied rhetoric, and you may not be as easily persuaded by them. Uh, in fact, uh, the Greek word for frankly, or to be perfectly honest, or to be absolutely candid with you, is artlessly, that is, without the art of rhetoric. Ateknos uh, means artless. Achilles, strong, swift, and godlike answers. Son of Laertes in the line of Zeus, Odysseus, a strategist, I can see I have no choice but to speak my mind and tell you exactly how things are going to be, either that or sit through endless sessions of people whining at me. I hate like hell. 
the man who says one thing and thinks another. So this is how I see it. I cannot imagine Agamemnon or any other Greek persuading me, not after the thanks I got for fighting this war. He won't marry Agamemnon's daughter, not he, not for that. And Achilles makes it clear that whatever happens, he's going home tomorrow. And the Greeks had better follow him because as far as he's concerned, the war is over. So much honor means to Achilles that no amount of money, no bevy of beautiful women, no honor, no treasure that can be given him now can make up for the insult that he has received. Then the old man, Phoenix, gives another long, slightly meandering speech, telling stories, reminding Achilles of how uh, he took care of Achilles uh, when, he was a, when he was a baby. I made you what you are, my godlike Achilles, says the old man. I loved you from my heart. You wouldn't eat, whether it was at a feast or a meal in the house, unless I set you on my lap and cut your food up and fed it to you and held the wine to your lips. Many a time you wet the tunic on my chest, burping up wine when you were colicky. So Phoenix appeals to that history, his own personal history with Achilles, as well as uh, the moral lesson of a, of a mythological tale he tells. That works slightly better. Achilles is not going to be angry at Phoenix. He's not going to suspect that Phoenix is lying to him. And so he says, well, I might stick around, but I'm certainly not going to fight. But I might stick around. Then comes Ajax. Ajax, the big lunk Ajax, the man so large that people often refer to him as an ax. The man Agamemnon once said was like an ax, like an ox, easily moved with a small goad. Ajax has never had to use words very much. He's so big and strong, doesn't have to talk. He just arrives and people run away. <laughs> doesn't have to say much. And you, you probably met Odysseus and Ajax on the playground in elementary school, right? Uh, and maybe you were Ajax, or maybe you were Odysseus. Maybe you were the brains, or maybe you were the brawn. Uh, maybe you were the guy who could do the tricks. Maybe you were the guy with the muscle. But the guy with the muscle didn't have to say much, didn't have to prove himself in class as a smart guy, because it wasn't necessary. He could uh, win any of the contests that were important to boys. He could just win by being big and strong. Ajax gives a very, very short speech, and it ends like this. You, Achilles, the gods have replaced your heart with flint and malice because of one girl, one single girl that Agamemnon took away from you. While well, we're offering you seven of the finest women to be found and many other gifts, show some generosity and some respect. We have come under your roof, we few, out of the entire army, trying hard to be the friends you care for most of all. Why are you doing this to us? We are your friends. Ajax, the man of few words, speaks from the heart, and he speaks of friendship. And this is the man who is a good friend. He is the man you'd want as a friend, because if you need him, he will be there. He's that kind of friend. And this time Achilles moves a little further. How could he be angry with Ajax? Ajax, who speaks from the heart, Ajax would never lie to him. So he says, well, I guess I'll stick, stick around a bit longer, but I'm not going to fight. So in spite of everything, it was Ajax and not Odysseus who made the biggest dent in Achilles' anger. Odysseus was the least effective because he was the most artful. Ajax 
was the most effective because he was the least artful, because he simply spoke from the heart. And that, uh, this is really is the first uh, lesson in Greek rhetoric in the history of the subject of rhetoric. And it's a very important one. It's, it's why most speakers will tell you that they're not going to be polished speakers. Uh, they, don't, they have no intention of using rhetoric. They will speak from the heart and tell you the truth that they believe. Uh, and that, of course, is a very artful way to begin, as you, you know, probably know. Yeah. So uh, Ajax and uh, Odysseus go home. They, they're not terribly happy because they haven't won the day with Achilles, but Achilles will stay. And because he stays, his best friend is there to die at the hands of Hector. And because he dies at the hands of Hector, Achilles will fly back into the fray and beat back the Trojans, kill Hector, and eventually he himself will be killed. So now back to the contest. Ajax and Odysseus. Which one is the best of the Greeks? They have different kinds of talent, different strengths. How are you going to arrange a fair contest? You know, if you uh, suppose uh, you're the CEO of a of a of a of a tech uh, a small tech company, and you've got some brilliant technical designer uh, who is uh, being recruited busily by other firms. It's not terribly loyal to you, but you've really got to keep him. And you've got a uh, a loyal, hardworking uh, marketing person who. Uh, works in the trenches every day selling the products that the other guy designs, which one gets the bonus? Is it the loyal, hardworking marketing guy or the brilliant designer who might leave tomorrow uh, to uh, work for the, the, uh, the Trojan horse uh, technology company? <laughs> Actually, I like it better with investment. Suppose you're running a bank and uh, this guy could come up with the, uh, the, the best derivative investment, the Trojan horse derivative investment vehicle, T-H-D-I-V, right? Uh, so you, you're going to want to keep him. Uh, here's what Agamemnon does. He follows the uh, tradition, according to the later Greek uh, poets, he follows the, the Greek tradition of fairness. Uh, he sets up a contest to be judged by a, a jury, a panel of soldiers chosen by Lot. So we have a, a group of soldiers who are chosen by Lot, who are going to make the decision by vote. So it's going to be entirely fair. And each of the two contestants will be, able, will be given an opportunity to, to speak and make his case for winning the prize. And they will have equal time measured uh, to the precise drop of time with a water clock, a little water clock in which water drips uh, through a, a tiny hole, and when the water's gone, the speech is over. So it's absolutely and perfectly fair, isn't it? Is it fair? Uh, fair to the window, unfair to the wall. Yeah, you're divided again. Uh, but I think there's a slight majority for unfair. Uh, it does seem fair because they're given absolutely equal treatment. It meets all, and it's totally transparent, it meets all the, uh, the basic criteria for fairness. On the other hand, uh, a tug of war would be equally fair if we set it up on an equal basis. Trouble is, if you make it a tug of war, you know who's going to win. Ajax, right, because he's twice the size. If you make it a contest of speeches, you know who's going to win. Odysseus, he spent his life studying how to speak, and he's an accomplished and polished rhetorician. As it happens, Odysseus wins, and Ajax, who, remember, saved Odysseus' life in the battle I described moments ago, Ajax flies into a rage. You mean you're going to give the prize for the best Greek soldier to this shyster, this wordsmith, this master of dirty tricks, 
That's not a soldier. I'm a soldier. Look at me. I do what soldiers do. I have the virtue soldiers have. I'm the one who's brave and loyal. I'm the one you want with you in a fight. And you're going to give him the prize? Ajax flies into a rage and he goes berserk. And in his berserk rage, he sets out to kill Agamemnon and Odysseus. But uh, his killing spree goes awry. He goes so crazy because of the goddess Athena, according to the myth, that uh, instead of killing his enemies, Agamemnon and Odysseus, he kills a bunch of sheep and sets out to torture one of them, uh, to which he gives the name Odysseus. And that is the place that the famous play about Ajax begins, a play by Sophocles, who is uh, one of the world's greatest playwrights, the author of Antigone and Oedipus. Sophocles wrote a play about Ajax, a brilliant play all too often not read. In this play, we see Ajax and Odysseus again, but astonishingly, we see them with their roles reversed. Ajax, when he recovers from his madness, is in a pitiable state. He has been deeply shamed. He was shamed when he lost the prize. Now he's shamed when he's been found to have set out to kill the kings, but only killed a bunch of sheep instead. He is bitterly ashamed. And because he aimed to kill a king, he is about to be shamed even further because the penalty for trying to kill the king is death by public stoning, followed by non-burial, the body left out for the dogs to tear apart and the vultures to peck at. And two things happen now to save the honor of Ajax. And these are so important, I hope you're still with me because I really want you to catch this, what's about to happen. Remember, Ajax is the man who speaks from the heart, very few words, always tells the truth. Odysseus, the clever, the liar, the man who's always out, it seems, for himself. Odysseus takes compassion on Ajax and the family of Ajax. Odysseus will protect the body of Ajax from the ultimate shame. And that compassion of Odysseus shows in the very first line when he says to the goddess Athena, who's trying to get him to mock Ajax, Odysseus says, I can't mock him, I feel pity for him. That could be me. And you realize, I think, that Odysseus' brain power, which made him such a tricky fighter and made him such an effective liar, that brain power also made him able to put himself in the shoes of Ajax and imagine he was suffering what Ajax is suffering. So that same brain power makes him compassionate, his power of imagination. And so Odysseus will save Ajax from shame after he's dead. But what is going to shame Ajax? What is going to save Ajax from the shame of public stoning? Ajax will do that for himself. As soon as Ajax recovers from his madness and looks and sees what he has done and what is in store for him, he is so bitterly ashamed that he determines to take his own life. He thinks that's the only way to save his honor and the honor of his family. There's nothing else he can think of doing. And so his wife, Tecmessa, who's one of the great figures, I think, in Greek tragedy, Tecmessa, his wife, and his soldiers and friends set up a suicide watch around Ajax. Ajax then gives one of the most brilliant speeches in all of Greek drama. It is a speech in which everything he says is true and everything he says is false at the same time. He leads his wife and friends to believe 
that he has had a change of heart, that all is well, he's going to make things smooth again with Agamemnon and the other generals. Uh, he's going to go down to the sea uh, by himself for a purification ritual after which he will make peace with the generals and all will be well. And a parenthesis, just for your own personal use, it may help you sometime to know uh, that when someone who uh, has seemed suicidal in the past now appears to have it all sorted out and to be in good shape, that's the time to worry uh, because that's when he's made a plan you know, that you need to prevent. But Ajax's friend have not had the course in suicide prevention and so they let him go down to the shore by himself where he falls on his sword and dies. And it's at that point that Agamemnon comes with troops to prevent an honoring, an honored burial, the honor of a burial for Ajax. And Ajax's friends arrive also with troops to make sure that he does get an honorable burial. And there is almost a battle within the ranks of the Greek army, a battle which would have destroyed the army completely and blown any chance they ever had of winning the war at Troy. But Odysseus comes and makes one of the great speeches of his life. He persuades Agamemnon of the value of compassion. Agamemnon gives in and takes his forces away, and Ajax is buried with the honors due to a hero as he deserved. Now, yes, you might say, the rule is if you attempt the life of the king, this is the penalty. But Odysseus might say, what value are rules now? If you follow this rule today, you will divide the army irreparably. The army will be at war with itself. We'll lose everything. Besides, this isn't just anybody who set out to kill the king. This is Ajax. This is Ajax who saved my life and your life and yours. And he was there when the Trojans almost burned the ships. And didn't you see how he made the Trojans fall back? And he was always there when we needed him. And so Odysseus wins the case for not following the rules, but for doing what is right for Ajax, this Ajax, our friend. Ajax. Now, when I ponder this case, uh, I have quite a lot to say that I think may bear on issues that uh, you may face in, in the business world when you're uh, a leader, because you're all going to be graduates of this fine university, you'll all be leaders of something or other, and you'll be in Agamemnon's shoes, and you may have to decide whether the bonus goes to Ajax loyal, brave, steadfast Ajax, or brilliant and devious Odysseus. You may be faced with this, and you may uh, tr want to try to set up uh, procedures for determining how to do it best. Uh, and so as not to take up too much time with this, let me just say this. There is no procedure which guarantees the result that will succeed in this situation for these people. The procedure Agamemnon used was absolutely fair in one way, but it seemed very unfair in another. The tug of war would be fair in one way, unfair in another. Or take this. Uh, this is actually more like what often happens in the business world. When I was serving in Vietnam, the uh, people back in Washington wanted to have a management tool for assessing the effectiveness of different commanders in military units. They wanted something to count. They teach managers in bad business courses always to have something you can count. Well, very often the thing you can count is the wrong thing. The thing they counted in Vietnam was bodies, dead bodies. In the case of Ajax and Odysseus, it's pretty obvious who would bring back more bodies. Ajax, because he's bigger. Uh, could kill more people per minute than Odysseus. Uh, it's not clear that that's going to win the war because the Trojans have a 
an indefinite supply of soldiers that keep trickling in from the hills above Troy, just as the Viet Cong in Vietnam had an indefinite supply of soldiers. Producing dead bodies uh, wasn't an effective way of winning the war. Not only that, it was actually the, exactly the wrong thing to do because our goal there was to provide safety and stability, uh, win hearts and minds, and create the infrastructure for democracy in Vietnam and uh, producing large stacks of bodies had the opposite effect. So one thing you have to be very careful about when people tell you as a management tool, find something to count, make sure it's the right thing. It may look absolutely fair. Count this, count that, count the other. Yeah, we've got numbers, it's objective, entirely fair, but it's not accomplishing what you want. What you want when there is a dispute is justice, what you want when there is a dispute is the kind of justice that heals a wound, that brings people back together, that allows the army to fight as a unit once more, or the team to come together and play as a unit, or the company to come together and work as a unit. What Agamemnon did was fair in one sense, as I've said before, but it wasn't even remotely close to doing what was needed, which was to heal the rift between Odysseus and Ajax and their followers. If Odysseus wins, Ajax is mad, and so are all the soldiers who adore him as their hero. And if Ajax wins, Odysseus goes over to the Trojans or goes home, and we never win the war because we never have the Trojan horse. You've got to do something else. You've got to find some way of creating enough peace in the army that when one of them wins the prize, the other one will buy a bottle of champagne and celebrate with the winner. And there may be other solutions you can come up with. Who is the best of the Greeks? It seems to me that in the play I've just described, the playwright is telling us that Odysseus' talents are more important than Ajax's because it's when Ajax uses Odysseus' tool, deceptive speech, that he saves his honor. And it's when Odysseus uses his godlike intelligence to find his way to compassion and then to persuade others to follow his way to compassion. That, too, is a testimony to the power of Odysseus' gifts. So I think the play is telling us that Odysseus is the most valuable soldier, but the standard view in ancient Greece was that Ajax was clearly the right guy to win the award that Odysseus had cheated his way to the prize. Who really is the best of the Greeks? I promised you the correct answer. It's the poets. It's the poets who, like Sophocles, enable us to see the different virtues of the two men, how both are wonderful, how both are necessary. It's the poets who make us see the splendor, the courage, the pity, the suffering, the dirt, the sweat, the blood, and all of the humanity on both sides of the war. Yes, Ajax and Odysseus are both necessary and they're both admirable. We need the loyal and we need the brilliant. But above all, we need those who can help us understand the value of these different kinds of people. And they are the poets. Who is the best of the Greeks? Homer. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.